sorts of do you, do you have like a coming to New York experience? What was I, I mean not the crazy stuff, right? But if, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you like if it doesn't go dark, it's almost like a sitcom yeah. sort of um oh roommates, you know, um that codependence and sort of yeah. oddness. Um was that was that writing um personal in any way? And yeah, well the it was personal in both ways. Um, the reason I wrote the film is that I, within a, the span of about a year, I had two experiences with people very close to me getting into codependent relationships with people with borderline personality disorder, which is what Lana has even though it's never said. Um, and I just thought it was such an amazing way into mental illness in a film because in most films about mental illness you see the character and up front you're given the information that they have, that they're sick and therefore you judge all of their actions like, oh, that person's sick, that doesn't have that much to do with me. But with borderline personality disorder, they're very functional and seem totally normal a lot of the time, um, certainly in the early stages of the illness. And so it just seemed like, like what? And, and in life, you don't meet someone and they don't have like, I'm six tattooed on their forehead. You just meet them and you assume that they're operating under logical parameters. And then, so it's very easy to fall down the rabbit hole with them. And I just thought, like, what if you could do that in a film? Like, what if you just met someone and you just had to judge them based on their actions and you didn't know? Um, I thought that was a, a really interesting way into mental illness. Bravo. Yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, like, like, everything she does makes so much sense to her. Mm -hmm. And it kind of makes sense in, like... She rationalizes it. Yeah, and, like, in certain <laughs> parameters, everything she does is totally logical. It's only if you pull back and go, like... Uh-huh. Hmm. You know, but... <laughs> but it's, it's funny, we were talking. Like, because everything makes so much sense to her, and therefore, when I was playing her, it had to make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like, when, when I'm watching people watch the film, and I don't know if it happened today, but during the birthday party scene where she's like, and then Jeff and I started sleeping together, almost every time people laugh at that out of like sheer uncomfortability. And I get so enraged. Like I just have this moment of like, why are you laughing? But like, like, to, like it makes so much sense. <laughs> and then I, you know, but yeah. I wonder like as the directing that sort of script, I think that like that birthday party scene is a great example of a tightrope of tone that this whole movie oh goes through. And I wonder yeah. how difficult it was um, <coughs> writing and, and then shooting and keeping those those moments where it's it's like someone grabs your stomach in a way. Like I understand about the laughter, but I'm saying Jesus Christ right now. I'm directing. I mean, just tone-wise, how, how did that go? The one word that I always use to describe this film and the story is delicate. So delicate. I mean, even with the music, it's like, if we push too hard, it screamed, and it went like this. Um, but if you didn't give it enough, then you're kind of like, mm. It was always such a, such a fine line between, are we pushing too hard, or, or well, we need to push it a little bit more, but not too much. And it was such a, the whole process from like workshopping yeah. the script before we shot to filming it to then especially in the editing room. I mean, that was where, you know, we would go, the editor and I would go through take after take after take after take. It was just the very subtle nuances really made such a big difference in this, in this film. And like, particularly the music, because we at one point there was a piece of music earlier on that gave the whole thing away. Somehow this one piece of music in this one place and you knew and it was too early and the whole film fell over. Um, so yeah, I mean, and that's why there were 52 drafts of the script. It's like, if, if it falls off that tightrope, you're done. The budget was about 80,000, um, which includes pre-production, production, post-production, post and marketing up to the point where now the distributor is taking over those costs, um, which is, very little for a, for a feature in a film. Um, about 40% about of that was crowdfunded through two crowdfunding campaigns, um, and the rest was investors, private investors. Um, yeah, was that all your question? Okay. <laughs>
they got their money's worth, I have to say. Uh, one of the elements, too, uh, is a very strong cinematography and editing, um, and congratulations on that. Uh, I think that's well, well chosen uh, uh, department heads for those. The audio in the L, yes. Have you had any people approach you about mental illness and like what their reactions might have been seeing the film? Yeah, we actually have. Um, we've done a significant amount of outreach to mental health communities and groups through the festival process so far, um, and and they've actually sent quite a lot of people to the screenings. Um, people with borderline personality disorder, parents of people with borderline personality disorder, people with other mental illnesses. And it's been very amazing. Um, the first screening we had was in Austin, and I was so nervous. I had to keep leaving the room in the middle of the screening because I thought I was going to die. Because I had no idea what they were going to feel about it. Because it I knew it was a, a huge amount of the, of the audience was from the mental health community, so I was very nervous. And. Um, and at the end, the first thing that happened at the Q&A was this man stood up and he said, I'm, a, I'm the father of somebody with borderline personality disorder, and I've never seen this portrayed fairly on screen. He said it's always villainized or sensationalized, and he said, that is my daughter, and I feel less alone now. Um, which, I started crying, he was crying, um, and, and we've had that, that reaction a lot. And what's interesting to me is I think it's not, it's not strictly people who have had experiences with borderline because I think, you know, I think a lot of us can relate to, to either Lana or Kate or both. And it tends to, I just had a lot of people come up and say, you know, like, either I felt like in my life I've spent so much time trying to be what other people needed me to be, even though I don't have BPD, or, you know, so that's, that's been really amazing. Yes, down here. Yes. Have you thought about uh, doing the story on stage? Well, it's, I worked on it for about a year as a play before I wrote it as a screenplay. And I just, I couldn't get it to work. And I, I'm i sure a more talented playwright than I am could, but it, I, it, I just found that you needed a level of control over the audience's perception of what was happening at every point during the script that is very hard to get in theater. You know, because you needed to know that she was picking up the knife, and what if they were looking at the dog in the corner at that time on the stage, you know? Like, you just... Film gives you a level of subtlety and control that felt really necessary for the story, and the play got very experimental, and we... Like, I just I couldn't get it to work, and so... I, I don't know. For me, it just works better as a film. Thank you. Um, yes, then. Yeah. What happened to Natasha? I kept waiting for that. <laughs> what happened to Natasha? God only knows. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, that's both her abrupt disappearance and Mossy's abrupt disappearance is sort of supposed to help you. One of the things about people with BPD is they tend to idolize people, and then as soon as that person makes one mistake, they just shut them off and totally close, and, and actually the same thing she does with her mother, um, sort of deny their existence. And so Natasha and then Masi was sort of, their abrupt disappearance from the film was supposed to sort of help you understand that, you know, it's idolization and then just done. It, it also um, is an interesting uh, part. Um, something we spoke about earlier is the fact that um, the you streamline the story as you, um, as you not only as in the uh, um, script writing phase, but also perhaps in the editing phase. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah. So, uh, because because Meredith and I had spent about two years talking about the script by the time we actually shot it, I was really able to just totally turn my writer brain off on set and just trust that she was going to tell my story, which she absolutely did. A beautiful job doing, um, and, and stuck word for word basically to the script. Um, and then in the editing room, 
uh, Chris pieced together an assembly, you know, just line for line with the script. And for the most part it worked, but we realized that there were certain, there was just a little too much padding. Um, so there were maybe six or seven just really small little scenes involving extra characters that all got caught, caught from the film, um, which totally broke my heart <laughs> as an actor because there were actually, so there were only eight characters, actors that made it into the final film, and there were about eight more who acted in the film but then got cut out of these scenes. And one of them is Lion Hamill. Are you still here, Lion? <laughs> he left. He was here. Oh, good. So Lion Hamill auditioned for and won this little part in the beginning of the film and came to New York and shot it. I was so excited and so happy that he did and then his scene got cut. <laughs> and I was and it was so necessary for the film but I felt so terrible. Um, so uh, there were just there were little scenes and we just realized that anything that, that detracted from just the main story just was padding. That's one of the toughest aspects of the whole process of making a movie is that is that winnowing down and uh, pairing away uh, scenes and characters that particularly... Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Mark Moody. Hi. 